please welcome Chris Walty from Mitra. Hi, folks. Um, my name is Chris Walty. I'm the founder of Mitra. We're a two-year-old company based in San Francisco. Uh, I think I may have traveled one, uh, maybe the longest flight to get here. Um, formerly, before Mitra, I spent eight years at Tesla. I was in the front and center of production hell, where we were trying to ramp up Model 3. Uh, the requirements were changing. There was a lot of bizarre things that were happening at the time. I own the material flow system, so think of bringing parts to the factory and getting it to the line for the Model 3. Um, I spent nine months, had two days off, including weekends and holidays, um, and we ended up getting about half the system to work. We ended up building a new manufacturing facility called The Tent in the parking lot next to it. That effectively saved the company, allowed us to build Model 3s at the rate. Um, and I vowed never to let that type of system uh, cause that much pain to this company again. So I started the mobile robotics team, um, and then ultimately Elon wanted to build a humanoid, so I led that program for its first year. Um, loved the humanoid program, met a lot of the, you know, Damien and some of the folks that you've seen here. Ultimately, 80% of the work in a warehouse and 40% of the work in manufacturing is just moving things to where they need to be, and it's done very poorly. And so we're here to solve that problem. I think some of these statistics you've probably already seen and heard, so I'm not gonna dwell on these too much since I only have seven minutes. Um, but automation is absolutely critical to address these challenges, to be able to scale manufacturing the way we need to. We've heard a common theme today is how do we scale manufacturing of the robots? Again, 80%, 40. Uh, 150,000 people are just moving things around the factory. Um, that said, automation is not very prevalent. I think Ad, um, Aiden mentioned earlier about somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of warehouses and factories have no automation at all. It's because it's extremely complicated. I liken it to a ball of Band-Aids. Um, the system we had to commission, why it took nine months and we didn't even get the job done, uh, was because there were 15 different systems. There was every programmable logic control, every software system under the sun just to ultimately move something from point A to point B. Um, we're here to solve that. So traditional automation hates variability. Um, yet supply chain <laughs> is uh, full of that kind of variability. Dave Clark, former head of Amazon, uh, this was in a conference literally two days ago. He made this comment, and I thought that was hilarious. Every day uh, is a, a challenge. And um, why is that? Well, if you look at what Tesla does, the car that you buy one day is actually different than the car that you would have bought a month ago. The supply chain's changing, the vendors are changing, the product is even changing. That's why it was so hard to commission these systems. So coming up with a framework, how do you think about automation instead of building to specs? Someone says like, I wanna build an automation system, great. What's the flow? What's the pallet presentation rate? What are all these specs? We need to stop moving away from specs and start thinking about dials. Where do I need adjustability in my system? And for material flow, for what we thought about, it was quantity, like I want to be able to store a variety of types of sizes, pallets, cases, eaches, those are all things that are relevant to manufacturing cars or drones or planes or tanks. Um, how fast do I need to move? How much do I need to store? How much do I need to move? How do I want to interface with it? All these things are things that should be variables, not hard specifications. Um, so when you look at kind of density, throughput, and skew profile, you can throw these on a map. I think I made this myself. I don't have a fancy designer supporting me, um, so it's very simple. But typically, people stick with manual solutions because you have the flexibility to adapt to those changing parameters. Um, whereas when you put in like fixed automation, like automated storage retrieval systems, those tend to be fixed and you can't change those parameters. You better got those parameters right and hope that your business doesn't change over the next five to 10 years. So when you're thinking about automation, you kind of have four, three bad choices. If you're going to buy a family car, you got the horse, which is what most people end up choosing because they know how to maintain it. Although I, don't, I wouldn't know the first thing about maintaining a horse, so maybe that metaphor falls a little hollow here. Um, you could put incremental automation, like automated guided vehicles, et cetera. They're helpful, but they have limited impact. Or you could do this full automation if you go in like an Amazon warehouse, you'll see what it looks like on the bottom right. 
Um, it's really cool, but it's really complicated. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't know how to maintain a Formula One car. And so effectively, um, if you can combine all the four things, you may have a winning shot. If I can simplify the hardware, if I can build the hardware and the software for each other, if I can enable the agents at the edge to think by themselves, and finally, if I can build an adjustability. So if we look across recent history, we can see that moving from PDAs to effectively smartphones, you went from 141 to five moving parts. That has enabled a lot of software definition of the user interface and effectively exploded their usability. Electric vehicles, you went from 2100 to 19 moving parts. It enabled you to break trade-offs between cost, speed, uh, safety, performance. You can have all at the same time when before you might not have been able to. And I think we've all been, you know, we're all familiar with some of the, uh, the military applications as well here. Like I said, we're two years old. Um, we're building the simplest way and most extensible way to move hardware uh, through a software-defined system. Um, Aiden, who was up here earlier, they led our seed in A, free notes led our B. And again, when you think of the SKU profile, you want to be able to move pallets all the way through cases and eaches. Um, so that was something that needed to be true of our system. And there's really just three parts. It's a steel cell. It's a cell tray, which couples the inventory to the cell. And then it's a bot that moves around in all six axes. What does that look like? It looks like this. It's, think of like Lego blocks when you're a kid. You can build it in any shape. This is a bizarre and completely un unusable shape. It's really designed to showcase like how you can form it in different shapes. Um, and the bots themselves can move, again, up, down, left, right. You can software define your three-dimensional space. And the structure here, from a cost perspective, you know, you're looking at the equivalent of single D pallet racking that you'd find at Costco. Uh, and then because you don't need 9,000 pounds of counterbalance that you have in a forklift, these bots can be really cheap as well. So you can, again, break trade-offs around cost, throughput, flexibility. And you can turn a material flow system into essentially what amounts to um, effectively a set of inputs and outputs. This should look familiar. It looks like internet traffic, right? I have a computer. I want to send information to a server. Um, I have, uh, for example, an inbound truck. I want to put it to relabeling. I want to deliver it to some other station. All we're doing is presenting the material at the right time in the right place with a time buffer. Those applications can range from pallet pick, case pick, most of you probably aren't familiar with how like, your food gets to the grocery store, but effectively they come in in a bunch of homogenous pallets. Then they get resorted at a distribution center and get sent out to your food stores. That is the most common operation across supply chain, and it's done very poorly. Our system can apply to that. You can do dock buffers, cross docks, et cetera. But we have a concept that uh, when I was talking to the, 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 the group in this, um, this organization, one of the biggest challenges is like, how do we manufacture and quickly scale up um, some of the assets that we might need in a potential conflict? So we put together, I'm gonna pass through this. Oh, we have launched an Al um, Albertsons Tracy. Again, uh, within two years, we're able to launch a 24 seven production system that is live and serving eggs and stuff to people the next day. Um, but this video walks you through a thought exercise. Now the smart people in the room will realize we're not even turning that helical pile the right direction. So this is uh, a very quickly like, put together video. But what it shows you is, if I were to quickly stand up manufacturing in a conflict zone, effectively a micro-manufacturing site, how would you do it? If I wanted to design a manufacturing system for unknown product specifications in unknown velocities, how would you do that? Well. You would establish a material flow backbone in the center. You would put containers around the outside. Think of what Ed Mayer just showed you or uh, what you've just seen. And you would interconnect those with a material flow system that, again, presented the material at the right time at the right place. You could scale that up quickly by parallelizing those containerized processes. Uh, and then, you, again, all the system is doing is presenting material to the right process at the right time and you have a you know, area for manual operations um, over there to the right. Um, as the video plays, you might see the robot grabbing the material from, uh, from a storage location, and then you might bring the whip or work in process uh, for that to be adhered uh, and installed on the machine. Um, and again, 
the processes are not, in a traditional manufacturing line, they're all rigidly coupled together. So if you have a disturbance in station 20, station 21 is now affected. What that ends up doing is that reduces the productivity of your robots to maybe 30 to 40%. If all you're doing here is feeding and taking away from the, the processes, be it robotic or human station, um, you're able to improve the efficiency of the robotic system. Um, and again, you're able to do this in a very lightweight, easily, like you can assemble this in less than a week uh, and you can disassemble it in a few days as well when you don't need it. So this is a rough concept to get uh, kind of thoughts flowing and discussion around how do we quickly scale up manufacturing? Um, and we're, you know, we're here to solve the material flow component of that, which is not terribly sexy. Um, it doesn't get a lot of fanfare, but it's the foundation that underpins uh, a lot of what manufacturing, uh, a lot of the labor and the operations in manufacturing environments. And I think I'm even ahead of time. <laughs>